So on the Lewis Nichols show today, I'm really excited to bring on my next guest. It's Matt Seidau. How are you doing? Hey, I'm great. Thanks, Lewis. Thank you so much for coming on today. It's really good to, to get you on. Is it kind of early where you are now? I think there's like a five hour difference. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's the afternoon here. So it's after lunchtime. Nice. So I kind of want to go on a bit of a journey with you today, which is um, kind of where your love and your passion for wrestling actually came from. Was it something you loved at school? Did you watch it as, as, a, as a kid? Uh, you know, I th my love of wrestling is kind of a familial thing. My my brothers were heavily invested in wrestling, and so was I. Kind of end elementary school, starting to middle school. Um, back when to have any entertainment, we would walk to the nearby grocery store that had one dollar video rentals, and we would rent the entire catalog of WWF pay per view events that they had there. Every single title that we um, we would get, we would go back home and watch. And after a while, we had rented every video from the nearby Blockbuster, the Schnooks, the Deerbergs, from every, <laughs> basically we had, uh, you know, kind of seen everything. We didn't have cable growing up, so I wasn't able to watch anything live, but um, that's sort of what got us into it. Um, and it was through those VHSs that we sort of started uh, wrestling in the backyard. And where, where was that moment for you where you realized, you know what, I'm actually going to follow this and make this kind of my career? Uh, I mean, I, I never intended it for, for it to be a career. I just, I just wrestled for fun. I started wrestling in the backyard with my brothers and our other neighbors up the street. Uh, I was already on the wrestling team at my high school kind of around that same time. And um, I was just obsessed with the technical aspects of pro wrestling, watching it in slow motion. Uh, trying to imitate it. I, I also, like, around that time, ECW started to really pick up in popularity. It, living in the Midwest, um, it was hard. To, it, it wasn't on any TV. You could only get uh, after the first ECW pay-per-view is when we were able to watch that. And, I mean, I was just obsessed with Super Crazy, Tajiri, Taz, RVD, and Sabu. And um, basically, a, a friend of ours... My brother's friend was a caddy at a golf course, and one of the other kids that was a caddy there, him and his friends had a backyard wrestling league, and they gave us a tape of that. And that was the moment I decided that that um, the don't try this at home didn't no longer apply to myself and my brothers. And we <laughs> set out and started our own backyard federation because watching wrestling on TV is fun. I mean, lots of people like to watch sports. I, I'm more of a doer. I like to do them and participate and create your own. So wrestling really played into our wheelhouse because we loved the athletics. We liked the physicality, and we liked the part where you weren't supposed to actually hurt anybody. So it kind of played into all the things, and, um, you know, we were able to collaborate, and everybody picked the gimmick, and we started wrestling in my backyard on a trampoline. Nice. Uh, we wrestled on a trampoline for like a year or two, and then um, over the summer, I was working in like a metal shop making mailboxes and um, took a little bit of time and a couple items from the shop and ended up making my own ring in the backyard out of like iron posts and wood cross beams and some wow. tires for support. And we ended up hooking up some ropes and with, with little turnbuckles that weren't super strong, but it was enough to really kind of start with no real knowledge start bumping and flipping and flying around in a real in a real wrestling ring <laughs> what were your um family's reaction to that because i guess for a lot of families wrestling if you say i want to be a wrestler they'll kind of be like oh be a doctor you know be a scientist be anything else you know were they supportive to you wanting to be a wrestler well i never said i wanted to be a wrestler i i just have always been one just, it's it, just yeah. in my soul and in my blood i just said i uh, there was no wanting to be, I just did it. And I, I didn't want to be a star on TV. I sort of thought that was a preposterous theory to, to even begin with. Um, I just wanted to do, I mean, I just, I was compelled by my internal workings, by my, you know, astrology sign or destiny or whatever it was that just compelled me just to continue to wrestle and just to, to kind of play that game. It was just, um, yeah, I mean, that's, it, it was just, sort of the the fate that was in front of me because i never thought i'd make money doing it i always i was going to i had full plans to go to university and i sort of was going to go to an out-of-state university but um around my senior year in high school is when i debuted as a pro i was still 17 years old uh, when i debuted on 
our local cable access TV show and at local events throughout St. Louis and Missouri uh, and into Illinois. And um, so I chose a university that was close enough so I could drive home every weekend and keep doing my indie shows. And uh, I went and I went ahead and got my business degree in four years. And basically I spent 0% of my time at college focused on schoolwork and almost all of it fantasizing about <laughs> what wrestling match I had coming up that weekend and how I was going to work at, you know, how I was going to make my subway paycheck stretch just far enough to give me the gas money to get home because, you know, none, none of this work was paid. Uh, so it was just my hobby. You know, I just loved doing it. And I, I wasn't, I didn't have a destination in mind. I didn't have, you know, I didn't have a list of guys I wanted to wrestle. I was just doing it for fun. Um, it was really n nothing I ever expected to pay my bills. And with the independent scene, I mean, I've seen it before where I've worked um, at independent uh, wrestling as a, like an announcer and stuff. Um, it's really hard work because it's, um, I know the wrestlers, there's not much money in it whatsoever. There's a lot of traveling. So when you're doing stuff like that, is it kind of like a rehearsal in the sense where you get to really learn everything about the business and kind of fine tune the character? No, I mean, it was just for fun. I mean, there was... Oh. I mean, you know, refine the character. I mean, that's not how we talked back then. Wrestling was a completely different world. Lewis, how old are you, man? 27. I was seven right when on. you started. Right. So I'm, I'm about 10 years older than you. And the way wrestling was the 10 years ago, it was just, it was an unknown world. That, that, I think what interested me the most about wrestling was the fact that this is in like the early days of 14.4 modems and 28.8 dial-up modems on AOL. So you couldn't find out these kind of details about what wrestling actually was or what it was. You act, the only way to learn about wrestling was to go to a local wrestling school. And to do that, it required you to get, uh, to be able to just take an ass kicking. And uh, so that's kind of the, the wrestling that I walked into was the less friendly, more physically violent and tough, kind of rough and gritty. Uh, America, the wrestling in the Midwest at this time, the most popular type of wrestling was hardcore wrestling, like the ECW style, but not just ECW, like exploding ring barbed wire death matches, table matches every week. The first spot I ever did on a TV show was come out to the ring and then just get put through a table. Um, you know, sort of how they tested you to see if you were worth anything back then. Uh, just a little bit uh, more of a Wild West than an actual business. To, 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 call it a, to call it a business would be uh, a stretch. <laughs> uh, well, I was going to, you just mentioned your love of ECW a little bit earlier, and, you know, the people that were in it. And you actually obviously got to work as a wrestler on ECW. So when you were... Uh, on not the, the show, same one, but... No, not... <laughs> yeah. Were you a little bit disappointed it wasn't quite the same as what you remembered and what you loved? No, no. I, I was thrilled to be doing that version, but to like, say the ECW that I did was the ECW that I fell in love with was just like completely different. Just very, you know. Yeah. But, um, you know, it was a good C show for WWE and it was a great chance because they had that show, because they had ECW, it did open up that opportunity for someone like me to, who is not six feet tall, not even close, not even 200 pounds, not even close, to step onto the stage and show that once you put a, a true entertainer and a true wrestler on the screen you can't take them off because the fans want them back and uh nobody was saying oh well he doesn't qualify because he's not six feet tall no one i no one even said you're not big enough or i i never was told that and but i also knew to play to my strengths and coming from dragon gate i i developed a really highly technical style um but then returning to wwe i realized that the niche that i needed to fill was the high flyer role and um, it was a little challenging to, to do it because not a lot of guys were familiar with my style, but it didn't take long before I kind of linked up with Chavo and really started to upgrade my high flying and technical skills for the WWE level. And how did you actually, how did that come about working with WWE? Like, did they approach you? Did you go to them? Or how did it all come about? Yeah, so I basically was just um, an indie wrestler, not really, never thought WWE would ever call me. Um, somehow I was in, I was wrestling for Dragon Gate in Japan. At the time I was wrestling for Dragon Gate and Ring of Honor, but I was basically a, a Dragon Gate wrestler that would occasionally do Ring of Honor. And one day we were in Tokyo and 
this is how old I am. You <laughs> to call home, you would have to go to a payphone and then dial like a one eight hundred number and then sixteen digit pin code. And then what I would do is I would call my cell phone to check my messages to see if anybody, you know, any old friends or if anybody just left a message to see if there's anybody I could kind of call or anything. Hey, uh, just a second. Is that noise in the background too loud or are you okay with that? Somebody I can't hear anything. Around. Okay, fantastic. Uh, it's not disrupting me too much either then. Okay, um, so I'm in, like, I'm in Dragon Gate. Where we've got like a show at Cork and Hall later that day and it's i'm waiting for the you know waiting for the guys to get ready for the bus and i call my cell phone back home and i get this message it's mike bucci who is nova from ecw uh or he wrestled with simon dean in wwe and i mean he was like an idol of mine when i was 17 he came to our indie he wrestled rvd and it was like holy cow the stars are here i thought those were the biggest stars in wrestling i would ever meet and uh so he had a message on my phone. Hey, uh, you know, we've been talking about you in the office and we'd love to have you come down for a tryout. Uh, we've had these shows in Texas and we'd love for you to come down and do a tryout. And I literally couldn't believe that I got a message like that. And so uh, I waited for the time zones to line up, gave him a call. And, you know, I kind of just got an invite to do a three day weekend where you can just basically do extra work. Uh, which, what, you know, what a lot of people refer to now as extra work it wasn't as common back then. But yeah, so I went ahead and did that. It was a very peculiar weekend. Um, it happened to be the same weekend that Chris Benoit passed away and all that went down. But I still hung out for a couple days. I stayed till Tuesday. Uh, on Tuesday, they told me that they're not hiring guys my size. I said, don't worry, I didn't expect to work here anyway. I'll, I'll be in Japan if you ever need me. And then for some reason, a couple weeks later, without a phone call or any information, I got a packet in the mail of a developmental contract for WWE. That's insane. That's crazy. So that, that came out of nowhere. You wouldn't have expected that, I guess, based on what they had just said to you. Correct. I, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, didn't seem like, it didn't seem like that was the direction they were going. It sort of was always like, hey, if we ever have a cruiserweight division again, but you got to remember at this time, my hopes of being a, you know, all I ever wanted to be was a cruiserweight or junior heavyweight or light heavyweight wrestler because, you know, of my, what nature gave me. Um, and they had just given the cruiserweight title to Hornswoggle and then they just <clears throat> got rid of it. They forgot about it. They figured yeah. nobody cares and that's that. And so I sort of figured they didn't care either. Um, but it turns out, obviously, I... Uh, to be an entertainer, your height nor weight really matter. Um, those aren't ag the actual factors that uh, inform whether you're able to entertain a crowd of 10 people or 10,000 people. Uh, it really is more about what you're made of and who you are and the vibe that you give off, the, your charisma level, and um, basically is a good time to start breaking the stereotypes. I never really believed in the stereotypes of wrestling that you had to be a jack dude in his underwear running around doing a bunch of corny stuff to <laughs> entertain people. I wanted to do the wrestling that entertained me when I was a kid. I wanted to go in the ring and do the stuff that would entertain my friends, my family, and my brothers. And believe me, my brothers are harsh, harsh critics of wrestling. We used to go to indie shows and uh, make fun of everybody. So I wanted to go out there and do the wrestling that you couldn't really make fun of. So that, you know, it was um, definitely an uphill battle. But uh, it was something that, you know, I was really proud of what I was doing and I believed in my work. And I, I really believed in Dragon Gate and the system we were doing out there as the best wrestling going. And, um, you know, I really feel like wrestling for Dragon Gate and Ring of Honor really prepared me to go to WWE. And it's funny because, you know, you're talking a lot today about you being a fan of wrestling. And I think that really comes through because you had an ability to really connect with an audience. And I think... It was just the fact that you weren't, like you said, your typical beefed up, jacked up guy. You had an ability to connect with us. Your in-ring ability was just mesmerizing to watch. So do you think it was the fact that you were a fan and you're kind of educated enough to know what you liked as a fan that you were able to then give back to us? Yes, I mean, I think being a fan had something to do with, like, I mean, obviously it did because my, pa I think people could tell how much fun I was having. But, I mean, to me, the, the, the ring was almost like a mythological character. Like, to be able to stand in a ring to me was, like, awe-inspiring. I remember going to, like, WWE live events as a kid and just staring at the ring, like, 
sneaking down to the lower section just to get a look at the ring up close. I just, I fantasized about that. I mean, it was, um, uh, and then my, my approach kind of to how I would do my matches that I, that I learned when I was doing the independent wrestling scene is instead of looking at my match, like from my eyeballs looking out, I would try and see the match from like a, somebody sitting in the third row or the fourth row and see what they were seeing and kind of put myself in their experience. And then, then I would cater what I did in the ring to that sort of experience. Because basically in, in Missouri, it's like, you know, nobody has a lot of money. Uh, so if a fan paid $10 or $15 to go to a show, it was sort of what I felt when I was a fan is if I paid 20 bucks to go to a show and sit front row, I expected to be entertained and I expected to a level of entertainment worth my money. And yeah. so when I get into the ring, I know there's a bunch of fans who, who worked from Monday to Friday as hard as they could to save a couple bucks to bring their family to a show. And I wanted to give them their money's worth. I wanted to deliver on that. I wanted to give them their money's worth in my match alone. That way, the rest of the show was a bonus. The rest of the show was free. But after you saw me, you know you got your money's worth. Um, and, you know, people just have a good time. And it, I didn't have a – I didn't really think the show was about me. The show to wrestling shows to me are more about the fans' experience, and sort of about like the the jokes you make between the shows, which entrance music you like, the the inside jokes you have with your friends on the way home. That's more important yeah. to me than being the champion or this or that. It's re it's really about like the the experience of the of the event and the show. Yeah, I didn't go to a lot of concerts. You know, we were never able to go to a lot of even baseball games or sporting events. Um, so I just always held these type of events as a real special place and i mean from the time i was 17 on all the way through the time i was at dragon gate getting to wwe i wrestled every single friday and saturday night it's a lot of sundays too i never had weekends off well it was all constantly performing constantly refining constantly trying to get better um you know in my early days kind of before i got to ring of honor delirious and i were traveling around wrestling for iwa mid-south we didn't miss a show on Wednesdays, I would still be in college. I would drive all the way to, to, his, to Delirious's house on a when I would finish school, drive all the way to his house on a Tuesday night, go to Nashville to wrestle for TNA, um, or just to show up and just to hang around backstage. Yeah. And TNA, since nothing was guaranteed, we were just jobbers. Um, and then drive all the way back, finish up, wrap up Thursday and Friday class, and then head back out and go wrestle for Ian on that weekend. I mean, it, I was just obsessive compulsive pro wrestling. Do you know, I interviewed um, a couple of weeks ago, Rhino, and he said something very similar as well. And he said, if people, you know, who are starting out in wrestling, if, if there's not a show on at the time, he was actually saying you should go to a promotion and just, you know, introduce yourself, see if you can help out backstage and just kind of get um, experience that way. Yeah. And for us, it wasn't just about showing up to a show. It was about showing yeah. up to the show that had the wrestlers better than us. Because when, when she, like, I mean, I was paying people to train me that I was confident I was already better than. Because I was a great backyard wrestler. I wrestled the backyard circuit in St. Louis, all, all, all the other backyard promotions. I mean, we had a good little network of, you know, loose association backyard feds. And, uh, you know, I just kind of understood wrestling at, a, like, an internal level. And I needed to find people better than, than me. And, like, Delirious and I just wanted to go places where there was the best wrestling and we didn't care if it was eight hours away or 10 hours away it did, you know we had cars and gas wasn't that expensive so we just drove and we showed up and we eventually got work and then all of a sudden you find yourself uh it, i would find myself in the ring with a guy like jamie noble and i learned more in 15 minutes wrestling him than i had in the five years previously that i had been grinding and training and getting my ass kicked getting my ass kicked by jamie noble was the true lesson you know that that's what i was working for and, and the opportunities we were looking for weren't financial. They were more like these kind of spiritual meetings where you actually would understand the, the best way to learn wrestling. A school's great and having like big classes and doing drills is really important. But the best way to learn wrestling is it's handed down from veteran to rookie with a one-on-one -on -one tutelage in the ring with a sort of physical language that you have to learn. And the only way you can learn it is in the ring. And so that's kind of, Ian really set out to give me and Delirious these opportunities and these matches with guys that were really outclassed us and really had to kind of reach down to pull us up to their level. I'll never forget this eight-man tag that I did 
in like Lafayette, Indiana. It was like, oh gosh, I'm saying I'll never forget it, but I can half remember the guys in it. But it was like me, Ace Steel, CM Punk, Colt Cabana, Danny Daniels, Nigel McGinnis, Chris Candido. And I was in a match with all these vets and I was so nervous and terrified. And they all went out there having the time of their lives, laughing, having fun during the match, speaking to me in like secret wrestling code during the match, reminding me what to do when I was so nervous and really just taking control and just, it, it, it's amazing what you can learn when you get in the ring with guys who uh, went to real pro wrestling schools or guys that have been mentored and trained by the best. So I would just, I was just immersed in that. And, you know, we weren't asking Ian Rotten for money. He paid us 20 bucks, 30 bucks, who cared? It would be enough to cover gas, maybe. Not, definitely not a meal and definitely not the Motel 6 that we stayed at. It didn't cover anything, but it, it was, um, you know, it was just a passion project. We weren't businessmen. We didn't consider that. I mean, yeah, we sold our merch and T-shirts and bad ripped DVDs and whatever, whatever we could to get by. You know, five or ten bucks went a long way back then. I mean, really, you know, you, you, a cell phone bill was only 20 bucks at that. You know, I mean, you couldn't really use it in many places. But, um, yeah, I mean, re re independent wrestling, there wasn't a lot of promotion. So you would just, we would just drove to the best one, the, the, the only ones we could get to and just surrounded ourselves, like to be in the same locker room with Daniel, Brian Danielson and Nigel McGinnis. I mean, it like when, when I'll never forget when I first found out about CM Punk and Colt Cabana from a fan gave me this VHS of them. And it just, they just blew my mind. And I was like, okay, whatever these guys are doing, this is where I need to be. And basically, I kind of, Tra I followed in their footsteps. I trailed them. Whatever fed they wrestled for, IWA Mid South. I go wrestle there. They wrestled for somebody in Ohio. Well, I'd see if I could wrestle there. They wrestled for IWC in Pennsylvania. Okay, me and Delirious are making our way up there. You know, uh, uh, Wednesday in Evansville. Well, sure, let's go there too. Do you know, it's so refreshing to hear because the way you were talking there, a lot of people talk about wanting the the fame side of wrestling, but it seems for you, you just wanted to keep learning and keep getting better. And I think that's really refreshing just to hear. Yeah, I, I liked wrestling. I never liked the idea of being a star, being famous. I just, uh, the, that, that's, that was a modern idea after reality shows and TV and after American Idol, people think they could just go from guy on the street to guy in the ring in the spotlight and be a star. I mean, that's, that's just such a naive approach. And really go, go, hoping to get fame is a really selfish approach to pro wrestling because that's not really – the art of pro wrestling, but really, I just wanted to get the respect of the wrestlers I respected and idolized growing up. That was what wrestling was about. It was about earning respect and and earning the respect of the of the fans, sure, but earning the respect of the wrestlers in the back. That was our goal. You know that that was the ultimate test. And talking about wrestlers and kind of a good high quality of wrestlers, I want to go back to Ring of Honor with Generation Next now. The, that group as a faction, you look at the names in there and it's incredible, especially looking back now. Um, what was it like working with the guys and how did it all come about putting you all together? Yeah, no, I mean, that's just a bunch of jobbers, if you ask me. <laughs> 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 no, I'm just kidding. But, I mean, you know, the, the thing about Ring of Honor was that was like, you know, we would just come together on the weekends and meet up. It was just like the crew of Ring of Honor, I mean, didn't matter what, every weekend it was like a reunion. Every weekend we would get together. And I mean, I, I have to tell you, the, the greatest high flyer of all time is a guy named Jack Evans. I mean, the, he's the most innovative, creative, original, unique guy. Um, Alex, Shelley is, Alex Shelley and I would, before every show, get in the ring. And basically, he went to a real wrestling school, Scott DeMore's school in Canada. And I mean, I'm telling you, I mean, most of the wrestling I learned when I was young was slow motion replay off of uh vhs and so we would sit there and and trade techniques and share moves and then you know claudio uh, cesaro would step in there and he would show us this or that and i mean it was just these kind of uh every weekend this meeting of the minds and a bunch of people saying hey i learned this try this hey i saw a guy do it this way oh we saw this luchador try this this guy came took us took his seminar and he showed us a, a lower wrist lock instead of a top wrist lock a sidearm bar, you know, just whatever, whatever it was, the, the, the techniques that like we were just obsessed with um, growing. And then the, the performances were intense. There was like um, a stiff competitiveness to it. Like I'll never forget what being against 
Alex Shelley in a ring, and he just basically did like a shoot ankle pick takedown on me, and I was like so humbled by it. I was like, I got to get this guy back. Um, you know, because we were, you know, it, there's so much of this match that you can't plan out. There's 15 minutes, and you can only plan a couple minutes. And so there would be these free – in Dragon Gate, we called it the rally, where one team would rally, and then the other team would rally back. One guy one guy rallies up. I think they call it heat now. I don't – I think – I think wrestling terminology is foolish and stupid. So I try, I try and avoid using it at all costs because it's really loses its meaning. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we would just have these moments where you would be learning on the spot and you would make mistakes and then you get backstage and say, what the f- happened? And let's see if we can fix this for next time. And, you know, or, or like, what do I do next time I have the spotlight on me in the ring to myself and, and all that pressure's on you. And, I mean, we were just all learning on the fly. But we were, we were not trying to be anybody else. We weren't trying to imitate WWE. We weren't all doing the same moves or the same techniques. It was just, it was all about being original and, and kind of being fiercely independent. So I know it's completely random, but most people I've interviewed in this lockdown, obviously they've not been able to get a haircut or anything, and they kind of don't look their usual self. You look like you're about to star in a Hollywood movie. You look really, really <laughs> kind of neat there with your hair. <laughs> Uh, well, well, thank you. I mean, I really did wake up normally. Uh, so I buzz my head at home. I've always like, I mean, I, I would go to fly to fly to Japan and like stay up all night and like try and like buzz my head in, in the, the mirror of the hotel yeah. room and all this stuff. Luckily now I've got a sweet, sweet dear girlfriend who has been cutting my hair uh, religiously since the quarantine. We, we, we like, I'm always been a do it yourself. I mean, my mom made my first sets of gear and now my girlfriend and I, we, we make all my gear. We make knee pads. We make my entrance jackets. You know, it's wow. uh, a, a lot of the keys to success that got me to WWE that I sort of kind of withered away slowly over time. I've reconnected with, and it's really made me a much more complete wrestler and a happier human being. So, like, having a, a wrestling school to go to um, a couple times a week to train at. Uh, you know, a, a lot of wrestlers think it's just about having a body, so they just go to the gym and i mean that serves you nothing i mean it's nice to be in shape and to have that but really to, to be in condition for wrestling you have to be wrestling and you have to be wrestling every day i've had a, i've just been struggling the past couple of years with these horrible neck and shoulder issues that have really really impaired my performances and i've been trying to push through and push through and push through but it wasn't till i kind of went back to my childlike mentality that 17 18 19 year old matt uh, approach to, to wrestling that I've really just found myself again and um, kind of have the same fever for like, oh my gosh, like I'll wake up in the morning and I'll find a wrestling match that I like am watching at breakfast. And then that motivates me to go work out at my little home gym here. And then by the time I get to the wrestling school at night, I have like 10,000 ideas that I have to just run off on my students and on all the other guys. And then we're just kind of you know, there's, we're just, we're, we're working it out and making it up as we go and just trying to create something new ra- rather than like imitate what we saw on TV last week. Yeah. I want to innovate and then let the people on TV steal from us retroactively. Uh, you know, I've always been proud of that. I've always been proud of being ahead of the curve in wrestling. And so now with this new situation, it, it's a whole new approach because now re- people used to make fun of us independent wrestlers i mean that was the line oh you just wrestle in bingo halls in front of no one well i don't know if you've watched wrestling lately but everyone wrestles in front of no one now and so we've got the experience with that my students are really good at wrestling in front of no one we're damn proud to do it <laughs> <laughs> you know i want to take a, a, another step forward now which is go back to wwe and you worked with some of the greatest names during your time now one of them being who i think is just a legend is chris jericho um, and I wanted to kind of talk about what was it like working with Chris? Because he's the ultimate showman. So did you learn much from, from uh, working with Chris? Yes, of course I did. Um, but I'll tell you the first thing I learned from Chris. Gosh, you guys, you have to understand when I was in WWE, the locker room was like a scary place to be. It was not like the friendliest place. It was kind of occasionally depressing. <laughs> and um, I'll never forget what Jericho wasn't there at the beginning when I first started or I wasn't on shows with him. But when he came back and started touring again, the locker room changed. The atmosphere in the locker room changed. He brought like a jovial, like a, a carefree, but like a real happy, like a, a positive change to the locker room. 
So that was the first thing he did. And then, I mean, he's just a, an incredible wrestler with, you know, an incredible lineage that, that he's always been true to. Uh, so he's never been a guy who's mailed it in. And basically one of the top five matches that I've had, I don't know, maybe my life, but for sure in WWE was like a Tuesday or a Wednesday night in Manchester, England. And we just, we went out there and normally I'm, most events I was like an opening match. But with Jericho, of course, I got to slide up the card. And so I had to go maybe five, eight minutes longer than normal. And those are the eight minutes where I learned. And I mean, Jericho just had poise. And man, he clotheslined my head off. And I loved it. You know, that, that was the exact type of wrestling I was looking for. Because I actually had some complaints occasionally to, our, to my boy, Mike the Miz. Because I would tell him, ah, his clothesline was too damn weak. He would have clotheslined Randy Orton. And I mean, it didn't even look like he heard him. And I mean, when Jericho gave me the clothesline that I felt for days, that's what I was looking for. Because that's the kind of wrestling I always believed in. You're not going to hurt somebody by clotheslining them. I mean, in Japan, like my jaw does this. You know, that's from, uh, that's from a couple clotheslines a little high up in the jaw. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid of, get, afraid of getting hit. But it's all about having that impact. And when Jericho gave me that clothesline, we were deep in the match. I take off running. I hit the ropes as hard as I can. I'm running at him as fast as I can. And wham, he takes my head off. You know, I didn't mind. What I did love was the sound the crowd made. And uh, the British fans have always been next level enthusiasm and loud and caring. And doing like, um, and having that match there just really made me feel like a star. I mean, that was one of the first times I really felt like, boy. You know, I'm like it. It made me feel like a star because of the reaction that Jericho got. Um, also, on these European tours, you know, I would go and um, I would be in the ring and hear John Cena's music hit. And it, you know, there's really just it, it. It was such a grandiose step up for me. I really never pictured myself wrestling in front of these full arenas of twenty thousand people, and yet there I was wrestling Chris Jericho, who was an absolute hero of mine. And I mean, the matches were easy to do. We didn't have to spend, we didn't spend hours putting it together. We, it, the match just organically really fit together. My stuff fit with his stuff. And all of a sudden we're, we're getting towards the end. And I mean, it, it's just like this, um, that adrenaline, I mean, it really is this adrenaline rush that you can't get anywhere else. And there, there's a reason why wrestlers never retire or if they retire, they always come back. It's, it's because there's just, this real special energy that you get that the that the ring generates all this attention focused in on it and you have fans who've been you know loyal and dedicated for so long you know Jericho really has a, a loyal following and the, the the fans response to these events is kind of like a drug that you just want to get more of you mentioned um, just prior to that that he changed the kind of dynamics of the, the locker room. And you said before that it wasn't, say, kind of the nicest place to be in. Why do you think that was? You know, were, were people not kind of like, was it not a group of friends all chatting? Like, how would you describe it? Yes, people, uh, I mean, we were all, everybody was friends, especially, you know, the, the guys always seemed to get along. Um, but we were all, everybody was just ragged, tired. I mean, you, the, right. the, the road, the grind is tough and we would be on the road. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, go home Wednesday, Thursday, you're off unless you're doing radio interviews, which you almost always have to do. Sometimes those are at 6 a.m. Uh, and then you hit the road on Friday and it's just a lot of travel and I mean, you're just dead ass tired. Um, so Jericho came back, he breathed a little bit of life into it. And, uh, you know, the, the, the entire American economy is built on worker insecurity. WWE is no exception. Everybody was worried about getting fired every day. Me and Zack Ryder would show up and kind of think, yeah, oh, this could be our last day. You know, you just, you, you never know. You never knew. And unless you were one of the top valued stars, no one really had a secure place. So it just made it a little bit more tenuous being there. And, you know, by the, you know, it, you'd show up tired. By the time you get to Raw on Monday, you're already exhausted from three shows and three nights of travel and late night car rides and eating crappy fast food because nothing's open at midnight by the time you leave the show being your own travel agent renting your own rental car booking your own hotels the day of because you're not sure what town you're going to be in constantly changing road crews so every week you might not have the same guys on your travel crew so you would have to switch road crews so you know one week you travel with Kofi and Hornswoggle and the next week it's like Miz and Dolph Ziggler 
and the next week it's somebody else. And it just, it, there, there was just a level of uncertainty and uncertainty really can uh, chew away at, at, you know, people's sanity. And that's, that's the thing. I've been doing these interviews now for a few weeks with, with various uh, wrestlers and they've all kind of said the same thing. Like they went into work sometimes expecting to be released. Now, for me, I can imagine how that feels because when you want security, if you want to buy a house and you just want to feel that you're not going to get fired every single day. So did that ever give you a sense of anxiety in regards to not knowing if your job's safe? Uh, no, you know, I kind of had, I wasn't so worried about being fired as I, I was, I mean, they, they would just have these kind of massive, you know, Friday massacres where, where they would let go a lot of people, but it was just more about like losing your friends. So you try, like, I remember I'm traveling with Chris Masters and we've got a great like road bro thing going on. Like we're, 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 we're same approach. Like we both just get up, go to the gym. We're, we're on the same page. I, and, you know, and, and every weekend, like, you know, one guy would pay for the rental car. One guy would get the hotels and, uh, you know, I'm owing, I owe Chris Masters 60 bucks. I expect to see him the next weekend and boom, he's fired. You know, I was traveling with yeah. Brian Kendrick and Paul London. Wham, they're gone. You know, so it was just always this sort of fear of losing your friends. Um, you know, like even when I, you know, I left Ring of Honor, it's eight years later until I see the Briscoe brothers again. These are people, you know, you've fought and died. You've been in the trenches with, you've got this strong bond with, and all of a sudden it just disappears from you. I said, the worst thing about getting fired it's not about losing your job. It's really about like the relationships that you have and the support system that you have that you basically lose because you end up in it. If you're not on the same company, you're in a different universe. All of a sudden you're in a completely different world, completely different planet. And you know, it's not personal. We're all, all the guys get along, but this is before group texts. This is before group chats This is before WhatsApp and all that. And it was just, you know, you would just be afraid of losing your friends and like you'd fear, you, you know, it wasn't as much fear for yourself as it was for the other guy. And like, just, hoping everybody could stick together and it's you know it's just um it was just a very different world there weren't that as many positions in wwe as there are now there's just a lot more it's a lot fatter roster now um which i think is really good because they're able to have a lot more talent under contract and everybody's able to find a role now but back then it was spots were tight and if somebody came in and started working then you lost your spot if you got hurt there was no guarantee of coming back. Now I, I, I believe guys are kind of assured that when they get hurt, they can come back. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a different atmosphere. I think it's definitely um, changed more in favor of the wrestlers. I think that's kind of what Triple H has really done I, because he is – I mean, when I was uh, – you know, in, my, in these early days, every house show that I would do, when I would come to the back, Triple H would give me advice. You know, all, all these NXT guys coming up saying, oh, Triple H helped me so much. It's like, I, I really think the, his early days of, of creating kind of like the Johnny Gargano's, Adam Cole, these, these people, he really started, I mean, I was one of his first people that he kind of gave the book to. I mean, all the information he gave me, I downloaded it, integrated it. And then basically when I left WWE, I was out there kind of explaining to guys what, you know, working, when I'm working with Ricochet, I was sort of giving him ideas of what the, they that that mentality for wrestling was and what sort of the the big picture of being able to perform five nights a week consistently for years on end which is really the goal of a, of a wrestler to be able to perform and see his fans in every city every night give them the show they want and it, it, it did require a little bit of modification but uh, I remember some nights I would do a spot where it would look like I died and he would say you have to stop doing that you're going to hurt yourself and uh, you know that was those were some of the easiest spots for me and I ended up getting hurt on stuff that you would consider quotidian wrestling, pretty normal stuff. That's kind of where I where I actually got hurt. Um, so it was never really my my crazy stuff that that did all the damage. But you know, I mean, they were very disappointed when you would come down with a shoulder injury. It was just a different time. Like you weren't allowed to get hurt. You weren't allowed to get injured. You had to show up. You had to be there. You had to kind of work through injuries. And um, you know, that's that's what I've always done. It's crazy how much time has changed in such a a few years but i wanted to talk about your um winning the tag team titles um along with kofi now how did that come about you two working together you know i think we were just kind of put together by the office as a right. you know nice idea for a tag team uh Co kofi and i got along we traveled together me him and punk we were all pals and um I love working with Kofi. He's a great tag team partner and, and I loved tag team wrestling. It's like my favorite. It's my favorite. And so I was able to, 
I mean, I would take stuff that we did in Dragon Gate and literally just tell Kofi it five minutes before we go through the curtain and say, hey, if I'm holding him like this, do this. If I'm holding him like that, do that. And yeah. I mean, it, without missing a beat, we were on the same page. We had that, um, similar to what me and Ricochet had, it's like this no-look knowledge. It's like, you know he's going to be there. You know where they're at. Like, we'll, you just holler the guy's name, and all of a sudden, by the time you're whipping the opponent off the ropes, he's there for the drop-down drop kick or whatever it happens to be. Um, you know, Kofi was just a great partner. He, he was in FCW right when I arrived, but he got called up before I, you know, before we really got a chance to bond. So we really kind of connected while we were on the road. And I mean, it, it was um, a real cool opportunity for us. You know, we, we beat Otunga and McGillicuddy for the tag titles. But man, me and Kofi had some awesome matches against Primo and Epico. I mean, we got to wrestle Primo and Epico for the tag team titles at Madison Square Garden. We went 20 minutes. They just, no, no, no producer telling us to do less or do more. They just wanted us to go out and give the best performance possible. Uh, so, like, I mean, I don't want to sit here and say I'm offended, but a lot of times for some fans will say, oh, they didn't use you right. You didn't get this and that. And, I mean, I take that personally because I take all of the, the onus on me. But I really believe if fans had seen all the work that I did, they would be much more – they would think I got a much better shake than I did because – uh, I feel almost 75, 80% of the work I did was in live events and just 20% was on TV or pay-per-view. In fact, pay-per-view didn't get too many of those. Um, so that, that was, um, you know, I, I always feel like I got a pretty good fair shake at WWE <laughs> and I got a lot, I mean, I, I, I think I got a chance to change a stereotype and that's what I'm really proud of is that people don't, you know, nowadays kids growing up, they don't think of wrestlers as a Hulk Hogan type guy. They think of Rey Mysterio they think of Chris Jericho. They, they think of something more along the lines of what, what I was trying to push forward. Um, and now the, the Dragon Gate style that I came from, that I helped bring, you know, that the Dragon Gate guys brought to America and then kind of said, hey, Matt, come, let's teach you this, uh, that I got to be a part of and share. Now that's the style that's the most popular in all of wrestling, including WWE. But you have to understand at this time, I mean, sure, I thought I was a good wrestler. But even when I was in WWE, I knew the best wrestler was AJ Styles. Like, I knew it was like Chris Daniels and Samoa Joe, um, that those guys were always great. You know, so for me, wrestling in WWE didn't mean I was the best wrestler. It actually showed me how little I knew and how much further I would have to come yeah. to make it. And I think that was kind of almost scary in itself because I never expected to be the best. But when you get to WWE, they expect you to ex to be that Benoit, Eddie Guerrero level of good. And, you know, that, and then I was like, got some work to do. I was like, that's a lot of work to do. But that's fun. You know, I always like to challenge. I mean, I would come off the road on Tuesday and every Tuesday I'd hit the gym and do leg day. And then, you know, Wednesday, maybe a little bit of rest, do some laundry, wash some stinky knee pads, and then I'm back at it. And, yeah, I mean, going back to obviously working with Kofi, there was uh, for a little bit of time, there were some trying moments for you in regards to, um, suspensions from the wellness policy. Now, speaking in this interview, you come across as someone that always learns um, and you're very driven. So going back to that time for you, how did you feel? Because I guess it's hard for you because you, you must have felt a, some kind of sense of guilt to, to Kofi, worried about how it would affect you both. But then for you, you must have just been gutted about the whole situation. I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that I, I cared less about myself and felt really bad for Kofi. I mean, I remember talking to him about it, but you know, that's just it's just life. I mean, certain policies didn't really fit in with my lifestyle. And, you know, I, you know, you, you can be yeah. persecuted in many ways. That was like one of the ways that I was being pushed and prodded and challenged. And so, you know, my, my response was a little bit more aggressive than it could have been, but uh, you know, it's, that's just, you know, nothing I really dwell about too much. I mean, things happen the way they're supposed to be. I mean, if that hadn't happened, would we have the new day, you know, yeah, things work out for the best. I mean, they, you know, things really worked out really well for Kofi and that makes me happy. So, I mean, he's probably better off without me. And for, how did you become to get released then? Were you surprised by it? Were you kind of, were you happy in, in the sense that you can go and explore other, other options? No, I mean, I wasn't. It, it, so while I, I was coming back from my suspension um, and I at that time had a friend who had a motorcycle shop that I had helped kind of invest and start up. And so I was doing business and wrestling and I went to that motorcycle shop one day and wiped out on a bike and I just destroyed my foot. And I mean, I woke up this morning and my foot hurts. So, um, 
WWE, you know, they, they, I, I get my, I have emergency surgery. You know, nobody really called or cared. I don't even know if they believed me for, to be honest, but yeah, so that, you know, I had this horrible surgery, um, this huge nub sticking out of my foot and, uh, I figured, oh, you know, it won't take me that long to recover. The doctor says you'll never wrestle again. I said, oh, doctors, what do they know? Um, you know, famous last words. Um, you know, and, and after about a year, they were, WWE was really hoping to, to bring me back. I think they had some ideas for me. And I just said, hey, I, I'd love to come back. I'm cleared by the doctors, but I'm cleared. But that wasn't a real clearing because they, the, the doctor said you're cleared, uh, meaning that they couldn't do any more help for me. But I didn't have any ninja ability. Yeah, I could walk down the street, but I mean, I couldn't even walk long distances. I couldn't jog, let alone run or do a backflip. So, you know, I just kept saying, hey, I can't do anything. I'm still too hurt. And so after about a year and a half of that, WWE just said, well, you know, if, you, if you're cleared by the doctors and you can't come to work, then, you know, we don't really need you. And so they just let me go. And I thought, oh, great. You know, I'll go back and just, I'll go wrestle other places. But I had three, you know, when you get released, I had sort of had three months. And I said, oh, by the end of this three months, I'll for sure be ready. So three months goes by. I come back. I do my first match back. And first thing I do in the match is roll my ankle. You know, I was, you know, I was slower than I wanted to be. I was not where I wanted to be. And it just was just a challenge. But at that point, you have to work to make money. And I just kind of taped my ankle up and taped my foot up and just kept showing up, even though I felt like I wasn't where I wanted to be. How is it now? Is it kind of much better, you know, in regards to being able to wrestle? You know, it, it gives, it comes and it goes. It's, 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 right. it's, it's, it's a challenge. And I mean, I, I do a physical style. I mean, I've, I, I've kicked guys in the head with my foot and just my foot hurts way more than their head. Uh, you know, if I do a shooting star press, my feet come crashing into the mat and it's just, you know, I just limp through airports and I lean on my bag. My, my, I've got a four-wheeled rolling bag that I like lean on like it's a crutch and I just hobble through. I mean, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. I, I really feel like today my ankle's as, be, as good as it's ever been, but it's still not where I'd like it to be. It's just a, you know, it's just, uh, you know, you can't, injuries are injuries. They don't go away. They don't, like my foot is just still um, a mess, but, you know, we just work through it and I work around it and, you know, you just work, you know, you, it's nothing you can do, so I just deal, you know, I just accept it for what it is. I mean, since leaving the WWE, you've really kind of gone all in with, with wrestling, and you, you're kind of, you've got this buzz, this incredible buzz about you. It doesn't matter who I talk to with wrestling fans. You mention your name, and everyone gets excited. They want to talk about something you've done in Japan, something you've done at Ring of Honor. You're, you're just creating this buzz. So do you feel a sense of freedom at the minute where you're able to be really creative and just kind of show everyone who the real Matt is? Uh, well, you know, I, I really do feel like I'm, I, 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 the past two years I've had some real physical limitations, like, uh, the end of my stuff in impact, I was just, I had no neck, I had no arm. And so like Brian Cage was like clotheslining me and I just wanted to quit. Uh, I, I dislocated my shoulder, uh, in a big six man match one time at impact. And, you know, I didn't even take any time off. I flew to Israel the next day and wrestled, uh, I just in horrible pain. And I just, you know, there's no guarantees as an independent wrestler and you know i mean like i'm glad i did all that work then because i wouldn't be surviving right now during this pandemic if, if i hadn't been putting in the work and trying to save a nickel and a dime here and there and um yeah i mean i've all wwe has some control but anybody who tells you that that wwe limiting them like kind of uh hurt their career or something that see, seems to me like a lack of taking personal responsibility and for me, like, I, I, I do feel like now I'm more creative than ever and I'm doing more stuff. But if I went to WWE tomorrow, I would do all of it. I mean, I could do all of it. The only regret I have was not doing my belly-to-belly -belly moonsault off the top every, you know, a million times when I was in WWE. But, you know, nobody still, pretty much nobody does it. So I can, I can still break that puppy out anytime and still have – I mean, I, I feel like I have a much more complete package to wrestling because of my physical – um injuries i was required to focus on the mental side uh and the verbal side of wrestling and then now i'm integrating the mind and body all together at once now and that is truly like the ultimate form of a wrestler like guys like chris jericho have it 
where their mind and their body are perfectly connected and perfectly in tune. So their body expresses what their mind wants. And when they want to express it verbally, they can do it verbally. When they want to express it physically, they do it physically. A promo or in the ring, they're able to do that. And that's kind of what I'm trying to channel. And, you know, I mean, uh, I got a couple bugs here in Florida. I'm trying not to get bit. <laughs> Um, uh, but yeah, that's, you know, so I, I mean, a, am I like, it, it, this is what, this is what I, what I like to think is that if everybody thinks I was good when I was in WWE, if everybody thinks I was good when I was in Dragon Gate in New Japan, like, wait till you see me now, like, wait till you see the tools and the things that I have now, because I, I haven't stopped going forward. I've only, uh, what, one of the big things that happened when I, um, went on more of a spiritual search was finding out who, you know, what motivated me to wrestle in the first place. And like where, you know, that, that heart and mind state that, that had me wrestling just for the pure love of it. And because I have my own wrestling school in uh, Clearwater, Florida, because I have that, I'm able to just do the wrestling that I love the most. I'm able to have my brother, Mike Seidel, come down and teach the Dragon Gate Dojo style. I'm able to teach the variety of things that I've learned throughout my career. And I'm able to do wrestling on my terms how I want and prepare my guys for their ventures into NXT or AEW or their ventures into Evolve or wherever they're trying to get tryouts at. Prepare them for that. And then so, I mean, like, if I'm preparing them for these places, it's also preparing myself for them. So, I, I mean, I feel like I've, I'm better than ever, healthier than ever. Uh, I still have my foot issue, and I, I'm really coming over the neck issue, but that's still a serious thing that you have to be – careful about and cautious about because you know i i had the neck x-rays and i had all the mris done and um there's no surgery needed it's just kind of one of these you need rest but you know we all need rest and uh but we all also have to make a buck so you know i'm just gonna keep doing this uh like i was super excited to get back to ring of honor where i would be like really tuning back in with my old crew that inspired me my old you know, men mentors, old um, opponents, and all these guys that really kind of got me propelled, that gave me the boost to get to WWE in the first place. Working with them again would be, you know, was going to be awesome. I was looking forward to that ROH, uh, whatever, past versus present, which is just right after, like, the anniversary show. And, you know, I've been a part of Ring of Honor, a huge part of my career. It was, like, for me, getting to Ring of Honor was the dream. I wasn't like, I need to, I, I dreamed of wrestling in WWE. I dreamed of wrestling in Ring of Honor. And, um, you know, that's something I look forward to getting back into. But it depends, you know, there's so many cool places to wrestle now. I mean, I really feel like even though I'm not in AEW, what AEW stands for and represents is what I stand for and represent. Like, we're, we're, we're the, like I am a part of it, whether I'm in there or not. And, you know, it's just, it's like, a delight for me to see the young bucks get the success yeah. that they deserve and the success that like, I mean, the, to, to me, without a shadow of a doubt, they're the best tag team. And then they, they, they've all, they've been that for years. And then, they, then I watched like being the elite number 200 and they're wrestling each other in their backyard and it's the best wrestling match I've ever seen. And uh, so it's like, there's a lot of good wrestling these days. It, when I went to WWE, I had to teach people how to take a Hurricane Rana from me. There wasn't a lot of, like, they're just, the technique wasn't all there for everybody. And now I watch these shows, and it's like, you look at Angelico's Yave, you look at Jack Evans wrestling, uh, Trent and Chucky e. T, all these guys. I mean, it's just, there's just a great roster everywhere. There's a great roster in NXT, Roddy, Adam, Cole. Kyle O'Reilly, Bobby Fish, War, uh, the War Raiders. I mean, there's. So, I, I've worked with all these guys throughout the years. So for me, it's like I like the freedom of being able to work in the different locker rooms because there's so many different guys. For me, it's not about being loyal to a federation. It's really about being loyal to the locker room, the boys in the back, and just kind of being a part of the network of wrestlers that are trying to push the business forward and give fans something that they're going to keep tuning into week after week and figuring out how to do that in the, in an ever evolving, ever changing world. And you mentioned AEW and for me, just from a, a fan's point of view, it's like, it's a jigsaw puzzle with one piece missing. And for me, you're that piece. And I would love one day to see you in there because you look at Kenny Omega, you look at, like you said, the young bucks, the amount of talent there, it's one of, um, as a wrestling fan, the only promotion I've watched 
recently that I got excited again because I was starting just to lose a little bit of interest in in televised wrestling. I mean, AEW's come along and it just, I'm gripped to it. And I'd love to see you in there because I think with the intensity, the technique and everything you have to uh, to offer would just be, it would set the show you know, alight. No, I'll thank you very much. I mean, I, I really love, like, I love AEW and I even love how they produce their show. I love their camera shots and their camera angles because to me, like, one of the things that I dislike about WWE, or at least I just don't really particularly enjoy it, I don't think it does service to the wrestling is the production. So for me, like if I was never able to wrestle again, I would love to be, um, you know, sort of an executive producer on some of these shows. I would love to reinvent the way wrestling's filmed, the way wrestling's shot. And, you know, I think AEW has been a fantastic job of creativity and adaptivi- adaptivity to these new scenarios. And I just think now is the exact time where innovation and in production is going to elevate one company over the next. And, you know, the, the I always believe the wrestlers do our job. We always go out there every night, kick ass, tear it up. The live crowd loves it. But somehow when it translates through the TV, it doesn't grab people. Like when I watched ECW, it like reached through the TV and I grabs you and sucks you in. Yeah. Uh, I feel like WWE is missing that kind of, that ability to really reach down deep and, and grab people by the soul and pull them in. It's sort of like... um almost too polished version and I, I really love the way AEW presents it and I feel like I, I would fit in there I for, for a little bit I thought I was going to be that dark order guy uh no but um <laughs> I, you, know, I just, you, you know I mean like in, in new federation I mean there's only room for so many people you can only have a roster filled yeah. so I just like to think you know in time when things move and times it's time for them to um add guys to the roster I like to think hopefully I'll be in the running you know I the for, for me personally like my best work I always believed was against guys like the Young Bucks. So I would just dream of wrestling them on, on the bigger platform, on a bigger screen. Um, I mean, I could go one-on-one with a lot of those guys, but they're tag and six-man divisions. Like uh, Ray Phoenix is by far and away like the greatest luchador. Come, I mean, in he's, he's, our, he's our generation's Rey Mysterio. And I like that is not a lightly said thing. I mean, he is – spectacular he's exceptional he's extraordinary um man i like i just like working with him and john morrison in impact was really influential on me like triple a triple a wrestling became a huge influence on me actually when i was in peru with my shaman we were sitting down watching triple a and it just it, it really connected with me and uh, it helps re wire my brain away from the wwe mentality of there's certain things that are right and wrong into just like wrestling for the purity of it. And, um, you know, I think AEW would really allow me to show all my assets and all my features and allow me to have a whole lot of fun because it's, it's just got a lot of good, like hardworking, decent, honest people in the, on the show. They've got a good women's division. I mean, you know, so I enjoy, I enjoy it all. I'm going to I'm going to tweet that clip to every AEW executive going and then throw a party when you're actually there with excitement. <laughs> well, that you know it really is. I mean, AEW listens to the fans and and if yeah. the fans are demanding it and and so you know like for, for a guy like me it's just a matter of generating the the buzz and cr- creating a fan base that wants me there and you know what I mean if I sold more t-shirts on pro wrestling tees I probably have a better <laughs> chance of it. I'm, I swear to you, if you guys go prowrestlingtees.com forward slash Matt Seidel, M-A-T-T-S-Y-D-A-L. I've got some shirts on there, and, I mean, that's how you vote. You know, you vote with your voices. I mean, tweets are great, Instagram likes. I mean, all, all that stuff adds up, and it really shows what people care. I mean, I think a lot of fans, I get a lot of messages on my Instagram. It's like, I know you won't read this, but such and such. And it's like, uh, dude, I mean, I, I have my phone in my hand. I'm going to read the message, you know, because – it's a symbiotic relationship. There's no wrestling without fans. There's no performance without the fans. And we, we perform with them in mind. So hearing from the fans is exactly what we need to give them what, you know, give them what they're looking for, even though they might not be able to articulate it. And fans are saying, oh, he didn't work a body part. He, he, you know, it's heat. And, but I can, I can read through the way they're trying to describe it. And um, the, the hardest thing about a physical activity is then rewriting it with, trying to apply words to something that words we don't have words for it's like wrestling such a like it can i mean i'm always saying like when i wrestle on sunday it's church like like the last time i wrestled for rev pro it was like a sunday i wrestled Pac at uh oh god some really cool town hall 
in a small town. I can't remember what it was called, but it was just church for me. It's like heartwarming, spirit feeling, like reinvigorating kind, kind of thing. And I mean, like, you know, that's, that's what I'm looking for. And I'm looking to, to share that experience with everybody else because wrestling is what I love and I love sharing it with everyone else. Do you know, today for me, just to interview you, has been completely different to any of the interviews that I've done because the love and passion that you have for wrestling and the fans is just, I've never experienced that with other people that I've spoke to. So it's, thank you so much for being so honest today and to uh, go through kind of your career with me. It's been incredible to speak to you. No, it's my pleasure. I've, I've enjoyed the interview, Lewis, man. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that town you mentioned, was it called Cheltenham? Yes, that's it. That's where I live. Oh, sweet. That's a yeah. really nice town hall. I was like, uh, before the match, I like went out behind the little town hall. There's like a nice grassy area with all these beautiful flowers. Yeah. I was like, I was out there like a weirdo, like half in my gear stretching, like for, for like an <laughs> hour. And then, but it was really just like, um, you know, when, when I left WWE, there was that moment where I was like, I'm just going to be a businessman. I'm going to open up a cryotherapy center and help people heal. And, you know, cause I was really into therapy and all the healing modalities cause I've been hurt so much trying to help other people get healthy and oh you know I'll maybe I'll do a yoga thing or this I was really into yoga um but I, I went and wrestled for PWG and like it reinvigorated me and then I went and did Rev Pro York Hall and that was the moment I knew wrestling was not just wrestling wasn't just staying where it was at it was going to explode in popularity and that was maybe 2014 2015 I wrestled Will Ospreay and I was like, my God, there's a, this business has a future and, you know, we can be a part of it. And I, I really think like the European factions that have stepped up and raised the level, raised the bar for wrestling, it really kept the pure sport of it alive. Uh, like the, the British wrestlers always were in contact with Japanese wrestlers, same way with WXW in Germany. And I, I just really felt that momentum. And I was like, I, I'm going to be a part of this movement too. And so when all the British guys got signed and WWE NXT UK starts, like, I mean, I, I'm proud of those guys too. Cause I feel like I was a part of that too. I mean, I remember the, the first gig I ever got overseas was the first time I ever thought about quitting my job. I got, I got to work um, for IW, IPW UK, me and Delirious went over there. And when I got back, I mean, when I got back and had to go to my job, I just was thinking, how do I orient my life? where I don't, where all I do is wrestle. And, um, you know, it's, this is just, I'm really fortunate to still be here, to still be doing this, to have us, like my friends and family still support me. Nobody thinks I'm crazy for wanting to go out every weekend and, and, and still do this. Who else in the UK do you like at the moment? You mentioned Will. Um, is there any other kind of guys in the UK that you, you really like? Well, I mean, now they're all, they're all signed. I, I mean, you know, Mandrews and Flash Morgan and Marty. And I mean, everybody's, everybody, you know, that, yeah. that group of guys. I mean, I was at the, pro, uh, the PWG. I forget who won Bola that year. But like Drew was there. I mean, it was, it, was, uh, it was all the guys. And I mean, like WXW's whole roster was awesome. And I sort of never expected that to like transfer to WWE like it did. And then to transfer so well. I mean, you got Mustache Mountain guys that are just, next level technical character uh, originality i mean it's it, there's a lot of complete wrestlers out there and so it doesn't surprise me that there's a lot of wrestling on tv that fans have the option to choose from and what, what i really believe in is each show is not to be compared to the next one like you can't say this show's better than that show they're just their own events and they're all special in and of themselves yeah well, Matt, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure to get you on the show. Um, and yeah, hopefully speak again soon. Yeah, hopefully I'll be back at that uh, town hall. We'll get, you get to see me live.